All right. Hi, everyone. Um, before we get into introductions and the workshop session, I just want to take a moment to recognize that um, I am located in Kejibuktuk, which is Halifax, on unceded Mi'kmaq territory. Uh, and it's important, regardless of where you are, to uh, recognize the land in which we uh, live on and those who've come before us. And uh, if you aren't sure uh, which region you're in, I encourage you to do a little bit of research and understand the um, First Nations groups that might be in your area and the treaties in which um, uphold their rights. So without further to do, um, thank you all for joining. My name is Alexa. I'm the founder and director of Stop Trashing It. We're a group that aims to shift awareness into action when it comes to living lighter on our planet. And we do that by trying to host skill building workshops like this, as well as trying to get out information to our network that really helps promote this awareness into action. Um, and that all really came about out of my own personal interest and in feeling that, you know, I was so aware of what was happening around me, but I kind of felt you know, paralyzed in, in figuring out how to move forward. So I started this organization and we've been growing steadily where we now have over 20 ambassadors across Canada, two of which are on the call. Uh, Katie is our co-host. She's going to be helping guide us through some of the uh, skills that we're going to go over. And Jess is one of our ambassadors as well. So uh, Katie, do you want to maybe share a little bit about yourself? Um, yeah, so can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm Katie. I, if you hear any noises in the background, my family is closing up our cottage as I do this. So there might be some car door slamming and stuff. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so I'm Katie. I joined the Stop Trashing It Network when I heard about it. Actually, Alexa had come to speak in one of my classes at the College of Sustainability. Um, and was speaking about a different topic, but mentioned the Strap Trashing Network, and I thought it was really cool, as I am really trying to, I guess, go further in my own sustainability journey and try to always trying to pick up new hacks and everything like that. So it's been really great being able to be involved in a group of people that um, are kind of like-minded and you can bounce ideas off of and everything like that. It is really great to be able to have a shared network of people who are kind of all on the same wavelength. And that's how the workshop session is going to run today. Um, so it's very much uh, an interactive session where we can all kind of work together, share tips and tricks. Um, so I think it would be great if, if folks are comfortable to kind of just say hello, introduce yourself. Uh, I see Colleen has already posted in the chat because um, her video is off. Um, but she says hello and she's really pleased to be here. So if anyone else wants to say hello and introduce themselves, maybe where you're located. Sure, I'll go ahead. Um, I'm Jess. I'm also a, an ambassador and I'm located in Montreal, Quebec. Um, I'm very new at sewing and mending, so I'm excited to be here and learn a few tricks. Nice to meet you all. Hi, I'm Phyllis. I live in Broad Cove, Lunenburg County, Nova Scotia. And um, I've been using needles <laughs> in various ways for a whack of time. And I'm on, and I'm, you know, a long time person interested in sustainability and environmentalism. And um, I'm on some other Facebook group um, on repair and I think that's why this workshop popped up in my feed and I thought, oh, cool. You know, <laughs> I don't know anything about this group and it's always fun to sit and stitch. And so I'll Jeez, I just jam myself with my needle too. <laughs> well, nice to have you, nice to meet you. Hi there. Hi. I just uh, um, I have my husband in the background with a radio on, so I'll just keep off probably. But um, my name's Jennifer. I live in Ontario. I'm in Etobicoke, which is near the lake, um, just west of downtown Toronto. And I'm a school teacher. 
Um, I love to fix things, but I don't always get around to them. So I thought, well, this will be a way to make sure that I get around to it. So mm -hmm. thanks for hosting this. I found you on Instagram. Awesome. Thanks, Jennifer. Glad you joined us. And hi, um, my name's Susie. I'm also here in Halifax. Um, and yeah, I follow you guys on Instagram and saw this. And I was literally going to mend some pants this weekend. And then I thought, oh, hey, I'll learn kind of maybe a prettier way to do it. Because <laughs> I just always kind of make it up as I go and try to remember how my mom used to mend her pants, <laughs> which, you know, does it. Yeah, anyways, it doesn't always look very nice. So I was like, oh, I'll, this is perfect timing. So happy to be here. It's my first event with you guys. So thanks for putting it on. Awesome, thanks for, thanks for joining in. Hi, Colleen. Awesome. Colleen's joining from a home bay in Nova Scotia. Um, yeah, I am also very stubborn about uh, not wanting to throw things out before, like I really try to give everything its last life before I let it go. So I uh, relate to your comment about refusing to throw away your shirt. I, I'm on very limited bandwidth at the moment. So I thought I would just um, quickly say hello and, um, and then I'll just be off video and audio, but have been looking forward to this. Um, and I learned about it through Facebook. Um, I guess the only other thing I'll share about myself is that I, I run a large scale green energy project here in Bridgewater called Energize Bridgewater. And um, we're always looking for these kinds of, um, you know, sustainability um, initiatives. And I'm just really happy you guys are doing this. So thanks. Awesome. That sounds like a really interesting project. I'll have to uh, check it out if you can put a link in the chat. Yeah, sure. I'll do that. Awesome. And Jake, you just recently joined. Would you like to also give a little intro to yourself? Sure. Sure. I'm Jake. I live in Lockhartville, which is near Wolfville. And uh, one of my dreams, if I can get to it, is to have a really big maker space taking in uh, like furniture that people are getting rid of, chairs, mm -hmm. and like have the opportunity for people to learn things like upholstery and visible mending and you know, and if things go wrong, that's okay. You know, it was going to be a garbage, you know, chair or sweater or whatever it is anyway. And so I'm looking into the resources for, uh, for how to do that. Cause the stuff is easy, but the rent and the space and the volunteers or employees and stuff is, is a big deal. So, um, so yeah, I'm really excited and yeah, I've definitely been a hoarder, but I also, um, have gotten better at letting go of the things that aren't, you know, that I don't need, but it's kind of harder, the more broken or messed up it is, the less someone else wants it, the more I feel like I need to keep it because no one else will want it. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but just yesterday I had a, uh, one of those like long distance picker upper things and I used it at a, at a folk dance to socially distance, but still hold hands with somebody else because mm -hmm. I stuck a glove on the end of it. So I felt, I felt especially vindicated. Like I knew I was keeping this broken thing for a reason. <laughs> So, yeah, thanks for hosting this. No problem, super relatable. I have a hard time getting rid of things as well. Um, so without further to do, we can hop into it. I just wanna preface this with, uh, I am not a, a professional in sewing and mending. I too am self-taught, my mom sewed, and so she's passed down a few skills. Um, but for the most part, I was saying to Katie earlier, it's just trial by fire, um, trying to fix things so that they can last a little bit longer um, and you know you pick up to pick up a few things along the way um, so I too have also had this pair of um, leggings that within the first two times I've worn them I ripped a hole in the crotch and I've worn them a bunch of times since um, just thinking that like it would be fine I have kind of just accepted that it's almost part of the leggings now but today is the day that I'm gonna fix them <laughs> so we'll start with fixing quick holes um, so this hole uh, is kind of as you can see, it's right in the seam. So I'm gonna have to pull in a bit of the fabric. Luckily it's in uh, the inside of the pants. So you won't be able to see it too much. Um, but if the hole was, let's say ripped where there wasn't a seam, um, you would definitely, like you would be able to see it. There would be a little bit of a pucker. So I always flip everything inside out when I'm fixing holes. That way the, um, 
you don't see the string. Um, at any point in time, if anyone has um, a tip or another way about doing something, um, feel free to hop in and just, uh, just share. It's definitely a, an interactive session. Um, so one of the things my mom's taught me, and my mom taught me um, in tying knots at the end of your string. So I don't know if you could see, I have the two ends here. Oh, there we go. And if you um, put the ends facing downwards, opposite way of your needle, and hold it together, and you create a loop end, you wrap it around your needle one, two, three times, like that, so it's around the tip, and you slide it down the end, it goes all the way to the bottom, and it makes a perfect knot at the end of your string. Um, I know, right? I, that was shook when my mom taught me that. Um, really great hack if anyone needs. Okay. That's amazing. <laughs> I never have thought of that on my own. <laughs> you can do that again. <laughs> yeah, I totally can. I'll cut this right now. Okay. So, okay. So you already have your thread through the, through the needle. Thread through the needle, you have two ends. Uh, so put your needle facing upwards and then hold the ends in your other hand. So they're both facing you. And then flip the ends of your string to your needle. So when you're holding the ends against the needle, you have a loop. And then you take the top end and you're still pinching, yeah, pinching the ends against the needle. You wrap it around the top one, two, three times. So you still have that loop. And then you take the wrapping and you slide it down the back of the needle and then it's going to be wrapped tightly around the string and you keep pulling until there's no more space. And then hmm. you got a knot at the end. Did that work for you, Jess? <laughs> keep trying, it takes practice, but um, it is a really great life hack. Sewing hat. Okay, so what other types of holes are people fixing? If anyone has a hole. <laughs> I'm fixing a hole on the bum of my pants. Is it in the seam? No. 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 It's, they're just, uh, they're, uh, here's my complaint, is um, maternity clothes are like the worst, cheapest, most horrible clothes and so they always get rid of them so <laughs> like from nothing just from wearing they're just the clothes so they just rip randomly so um i've pinched my hole together so if you see the where the hole was this these are inside out now so i'm just kind of pinching it together so that the hole aligns right up with tilt this downwards a bit so it lines up right with the seam and so that way when I, i'm going to do a whip stitch through it um, you won't be able to see the hole because i'm going to basically sew it back into the seam you just want to make sure that so one side is the seam so that side of the fabric should hold pretty well i just want to make sure on the side because um, it's like a stretchy spandex fabric I just want to make sure that I'm grabbing enough of the fabric and pulling it into it so that it doesn't, um, that the thread doesn't pull on the loose ends and rip again. Um, especially because these are yoga pants. So you want to make sure that you're giving enough stretch in them. Um, so I'm just going to start by taking my needle uh, probably a little bit farther back than where the hole starts. And I always kind of do a test to make sure that my, let me tilt this down a bit, to make sure that it stays. And then in doing a whip stitch pattern, whip stitch is basically just looping over itself. So then on the opposite side, I just push it back through. When I'm sewing holes, um, I usually tend to um, over stitch rather than under stitch just to make sure it really holds and that you can't see through. And what I mean by that is that my stitches aren't going to be very spaced out from one another. They're gonna be pretty close together. 
Alexa, mm -hmm. Je Jennifer here, just a quick question. When you're doing something like that, like the inseam on a pair of pants, or for me, it was a skirt that split in the back, where it's a high tension area, is it better to use a certain kind of um, thread that's more stretchy or mm -hmm. will, you know, is there something to be said about that? Like the kind of thread you use or? You know, probably, um, but to be honest, I have this big spool of white thread and I'm someone who if I can avoid buying something new. Um, I'm just gonna use what I have. So probably in an area like this, um, some thread with a little bit more give might be good. This is just basic. Yeah, and, and I follow the same rule. I won't go up and buy something. I was just curious, because I don't know if it's worth fixing the skirt that I have, because mm -hmm. it was one of those, it's an age thing, like it's the cotton is wearing, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe I just make something new out of it. <laughs> maybe. So, so I'm about, I had Phyllis, I have a, um, a tip in terms of thread. Sometimes it's really good to use dental floss. Oh. It's very strong. You tend to have it around and um, it's nylon. So it, like that is, you know, has a little bit of stretch and like I said, it's strong. I've never thought of that. That's really smart. So I'm about halfway through at this point. Um, they're not perfect stitches, but you can kind of see how I'm it's called whip stitch and I'm just whipped around that hole. And I'm keeping the stitches pretty close together. How's everyone else doing with their holes if they're fixing holes? <laughs> Good. Um, to Jennifer's question, I'm by no means a sewing expert, but I do sew. And I sometimes sew stretchy jersey stuff. I, as far as my knowledge goes, there's not stretchy thread. It's the stitch that you use that, like when you're sewing by machine that gives you the stretch. So um, yeah, just use whatever thread you have. And when you're sewing by hand, like you can't make a stretch stitch or uh, not that I'm aware of, but <laughs> um, yeah, so that's just a little bit of info to my somewhat limited knowledge of sewing. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, a, a related question. What I had to, to mend today were a couple of pair of mittens. So should I be using yarn to fix them? Yeah. <laughs> Depends on the hole. Actually, I'm going to grab my mittens that I fixed. Like, I can tie off the pieces that were, you know, broken at least. They're in the crotch of the thumb and the thing and the hand. Oh, yeah. I've actually had these mittens since high school and I've already repaired them and the repair has come undone. I need to reevaluate. But what I had done is, so the holes in, in the gloves, I did take some yarn and I had kind of like, not sewed it, but I tried to make it look like it was knit and it did hold, but a few years later, the glove, it um, exploded. <laughs> just, they're old, <laughs> but they're so cute that I couldn't get rid of them. So I, I'll need to be creative. This well, you're, you're expecting so much of them, you know? <laughs> And they're so cute. <laughs> well, and what I have, I can show you is, and this is what I'm using on my pants today. This is, I don't oh, yeah. know what it's called. Like I use it to darn socks. <laughs> those, used to, those used to come with like a cruel or a, like a, a needle point kind of a um, kit. I remember those skeins that were multicolored. Oh, really? Yeah. So, like, it's kind of, it's thin wool. Like, it's thicker than embroidery thread. Um, so, it's good for darning socks because then, like, the hole that's usually at your toe, it's really solid. And when you wash it, it kind of um, belts together. So, it, it forms a good thing. So, oh, cool. um, I just didn't have a good needle for embroidery thread. So I was like, oh, I'll just use this stuff because I know it's really good. So that might be good for using mittens too. If you don't want to buy a whole, like when you have so much wool, if you if you don't have wool on right. hand. I'm, I'm feeling like this is the place to do something really pretty. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, and that has all sorts of colors and stuff. So, anyways, just to sense, that's what I'm using. And where can you get darning uh, scraps like that? I'm sure I got it at a fabric store somewhere. Okay. So, yeah. I'm uh, ready to end off my um, my string here. So. I've put it through the last time and instead of pulling this last stitch tight, I have a little bit of a loop and I tie my knots this way because I find when I tie them in with the stitch, it uh, holds a little bit better. So what I mean by tying it into the stitch, so I have my needle in one hand, it's already come through the fabric and instead of pulling this tight, I loop it into the stitch loop. Whoopsies, loop it into the stitch loop and then I pull it together and it makes a knot. And then what I do is I go through through the last stitch, I'll lift up the string for it. I'm doing this on the end opposite for me, so bear with me here. So I loop in through that stitch, through the stitch before it, and then I'm gonna do the same thing. Through the loop that it creates, I pull it tight and I create another knot in with the stitch. And I do this because I find when I try to knot it in another way, it doesn't always hold. Um, and sometimes I just do then another, and just another knot between those two stitches. So basically I'm just knotting it in to itself and it usually holds pretty tight. Alexa, yeah. I I was taught something, I don't know when and by who, or whether it was in embroidery a long time ago, to do almost the same thing you did at the beginning, where you put it through, but then you, you, wind, the, you wind the thread around the end and pull through and you get a knot. Is that just, maybe it's too not, knotty to do it that way, like too thick, I don't know. I mean, I've never done it that way, but whatever works. I don't think that there's a, yeah. one right way that way works for me. All right, just, just, just a suggestion, uh, if anybody wanted to try it. Nice, moment of truth. Okay, this doesn't look too bad. It definitely, you can tell that I, you can kind of see where I did it. Yeah, who's looking down there? <laughs> uh, hopefully no one. So uh, as long as it holds, so I'll do a little quick pull check and it seems strong, awesome. Has anyone else finished a hole? Still chipping away. Sure, you can see. Uh, anyways, you can't really see, but it, there, there, there's not a hole there anymore. Yeah. It's kind of tricky when there's holes that aren't in a seam because it's going to be visible, but um, if it's if it's a pair of clothing or something that you like, I mean. Yeah, as well. Exactly. I love um, the idea of visibly mending and putting on um, patches or darning something together. Yeah, like I was gonna put a patch and like sew it by machine. So you're gonna see it anyways. I mean, it, whatever. <laughs> I swear it's around the house. So, <laughs> so uh. I have these old pair of shorts also from high school. If you couldn't tell, I really have a hard time getting rid of things. Um, these actually don't fit me anymore, um, but they're still really cute shorts that the button fell off. So I'm gonna reattach the button in hopes that these shorts can go to someone else. Um, because when, you, uh, when we do clothing swaps or anything, if something is broken, um, people are less likely to pick it up. People love free clothing, but... Um, it's got to be like in wearable condition. So I'm going to fix these up because I love them. I love them for years and I want someone else to love them. So I'm going to go ahead and thread another needle here. So fun fact about me, um, when I was growing up, I still do collect them, but I collected patches from like places I've traveled. And um, I would sew them all by hand onto this knapsack I had. And I started in the sixth grade and I had this bag for years. And I sewed a lot of patches onto that bag, especially because uh, when I was first learning how to sew, um, I wasn't as good. 
so things would rip and especially on a backpack they would um they would fall off quite easily i don't have the bag anymore but i have all the patches ripping the patches off the bag was a painful moment because i have spent hours as a as a kid and teenager <laughs> sewing the patches on but someday maybe i'll make a quilt or something with a sewing machine this time <laughs> <laughs> Patches can be quite thick. Okay. So I'm going to do my trick again to thread my needle for those who want to see it again. The ends of the string are down alongside the needle. Wrap it around once, twice, three times around the tip. And then I hold the knot in my hand around the needle and then I pull it down. Oops, that one didn't work that well. There we go. Perfect. Okay, so I am not the greatest with buttons. I can reattach buttons, but they never quite look as good as when you buy the shorts. Um, so I'm wondering if anyone else has any experience with reattaching buttons. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, you have to be very precise in where the needle goes in, like so that it doesn't kind of skew to the side, right? Yeah, my thing is also leaving enough space underneath so that it's not so tight to the pant that you can't get the, uh, then, it, then it's not functional. So I'm gonna tilt my, can everyone see what I'm doing here? Yeah. Perfect, so uh, I'm gonna start from the back end, kind of figuring out where the button is going to go first. That doesn't look right, okay. Oh, a little lower. Super precise. Okay. So I just went through once and I'm through the back. So I have that first stitch. I went across the button. So I'm going to actually not pull it too tight and I'm going to go through the same holes again on the buttons. It's not super tight. Still quite loose. I've gone through twice. And now I'm going to go through the other side. I'm just kind of, I keep checking to make sure that it's not too tight. With buttons, I almost always end up changing my mind about what I'm doing. If it's an X or if it's the four, if there's four holes, I'll usually end up with threads going in every single possible direction through all of the different holes by the time I'm done. As long as it's attached. That's my, that's my Does it work? Great. Okay. So I've kind of, I've kept pulling on mine to make sure that it's not too tight. Um, I might just give a once over again through all the holes just to be safe rather than, sorry. Okay. Awesome, so that's nice and tight and I'm gonna do my same trick in how I tie knots this time because there's no last stitch. I just kind of go under what I've already done with the needle and I knot it into it using the same technique, just slipping it under, creating that loop, pulling through, slipping it under some of the stitching that I've done and pulling it 
through the loop. Okay. I was always taught to wrap your thread a couple of times around the shank that you've created underneath the button mm -hmm. before you knot it off underneath. And I don't know, you know, I think part of that was to make sure it strengthened that amount of space between the cloth and the button because if it, if it isn't, if it is too tight, the thread breaks more readily. Okay. So anyhow, just a, an old tip, I think. That's a great tip. I'm going to try that on the next knot I do. Okay, so the button on the shorts worked well. I probably could have moved the button over a bit more because um, I stretched them out over time, but it's attached. Okay. So um, hemming without a sewing machine is not the most fun. Um, I've made a few pairs of shorts before from old jeans and uh, it's fine. It's just, it's just tedious and it never turns out like, like on a machine. Um, so my, uh, my roommate got a dress she didn't like it, so she cropped it into, um, this is the top of it. It's just upside down, this is it. Uh, it's the top of it, I'm gonna do it for her. And she has the bottom bit. Um, so I'm going to start today hemming this by hand for her. Um, so I'm gonna start by flipping it inside out. Um, so, I always, I have some of these old um, just sewing pins, like what you would put in a pin cushion. Can you see these? So I use these um, anytime I'm sewing two things together, um, also for hems, um, just to keep things in place before I start altering it. Um, so in this case, I'm gonna bring this down. Can you see what I'm doing here? So I'm, uh, I have it inside out again, and I'm going to basically just flip it into itself um, and start pinning to make sure that it's equally hemmed all along. This is, there's probably other ways that are more efficient than how I'm going to do this, but this is how I know how to hem. Um, so if anyone else has any tips, feel free to, to chime in. I'm the same way anytime I've done it by hand, but usually it doesn't turn out well because um, I usually end up hemming it way too short. Uh, so that would be my biggest thing is always. I don't really have a tip, but I have a comment and it's you, you use the word tedious in terms of doing that kind of hemming. I like to think of it as meditative. Meditative. And um, so it's turned, having that attitude has really turned around my thinking around mending. You know, like I mend all the time and I, you know, I'm like, oh God, I've got to have something that I can mend, you know, to just sit and stitch. So I like that, uh, that tidbit, that insight. You're totally right. Our attitude and our mindset really does determine how. Uh, how you move through the world and how you see things. So uh, thank you for that. Actually, it's, it's funny. I was watching a show um, about, it's like a cooking show where somebody travels and they were with someone on a hillside in Greece where they collect the, um, the capers for capers and the leaves of the caper plant are used for something else. And it was very like, it was very labor intensive, but that was exactly what the gentleman said who, was, who the, the interviewer was talking um to you know this is just something you just you think about like one by one you know you pick the capers and it's you know one more thing in your basket it's it's like a progress not perfection this kind of moving forward but also just finding peace in it nice do you do you pick capers individually one by one just curious 
Apparently in Greece, that's where they come from. They're little flower buds, right? Oh my gosh. That's yeah, that's before they pickle them. They have to collect those little pods yeah. on the hillsides. Yeah, I'm sure they're made with other kinds of things. I thought maybe nasturtium even. Yeah, mm -hmm. you can make them with nasturtiums. I we make them out of dandelions. Mm, right. It takes a while, but they are rather delicious. Interesting. So the, the bud heads before they open? Yes. Oh, cool. Yeah. In fact, when I'm, when I'm doing my first, um, when I'm preparing my garden in the spring, it's, it's something that I really love to do because I feel like that's my first crop. That's really cool. Didn't Colleen, do you just salt them down with oil and, and salt? Is that how you do uh, that? Yep. Yeah, that's right. And I also, um, you know, it takes a, it takes a, a lot of them to get a little jar, um, but they do actually keep really well and preserve really well. I did it for the first time this spring, but we ate them up really quickly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna have to try that with my nasturtiums next year. I love nasturtiums. I imagine they'd be so like, because the nasturtiums are already quite spicy that the capers would have such good flavor if they're made with nasturtiums. Okay, so I've pinned down uh, one side. Pretty equal. I haven't done the other yet. I'm going to do one at a time. I might just add one more pin over here. Part of me is thinking I should um, cut the seam and fold it rather than trying to sew around it, but I'm unsure. I don't want it to pucker. I guess we'll see what happens. Okay. I'm gonna thread my needle again. This time I need much more thread than the last time. Always the tricky part for me. So, thread my needle, and I am just going to start. So, <coughs> tack that bit up. And so, rather than doing a whip stitch on this one, I'm going to, I don't know the name of it, um, I just weave in and in, in and out. Um, the only thing with this is you just have to be aware. I'm actually going to change the color of the thread. I changed my mind. Um, just being, especially because you're doing it by hand, being aware of trying to get them to look equidistant um, so that it doesn't look too wonky. Um, using, I just noticed that this is white thread on red clothing. Um, if you use a thread that's the same color, obviously it'll be a little bit more forgiving and I actually have burgundy thread right in front of me. So I am just going to swap out my needle for one that has some thread on it or to put some burgundy thread on it. I'm not going to get rid of this piece that I cut the wall saver for. Something else.
Jess, what are you working on fixing? Well, I have a, a jacket that has a big hole in the inner seam. But uh, right now, so I do need to fix that. But right now, I'm just testing things out on fabric. <laughs> That's a smart way to do it. So this, um, just feeling the difference between this red thread that I have versus the the white. The white is actually a quilting thread, so it's really thick and durable. This is much thinner stuff that's made for a sewing machine. So uh, sometimes I can pull a little too tight on thread. So I am making the mental note of not doing it with this because this would break quite easily. There we go, back in my sense. Uh, changing the color was a good choice because you can't really see this one compared to the white. Can everyone see what I'm doing here? Yeah, the biggest thing when doing the hem is just paying attention to making sure that it's in the same line and that they're equally distant stitches. Um, it's not a big deal, but it will look a little, um, it just won't look as polished. But again, someone is probably not going to be investigating your seam. And if they are, you can tell them to not. <laughs> it should be okay. Alexa, did you want me to get started on the leaf embroidery? Yeah, for sure. All right. Um, so I've done one already over here. So this is kind of the idea. I didn't put the embroidery hoop on this one. So you can see that sometimes the fabric, if it's not um, held tight by the embroidery hoop, it can kind of rip and you get holes. So that's kind of why I guess you use the hoop. But if you're in a pin, you don't have one, then it's not the biggest of deals, but you might get a little bit of ripping. Um, so to do a leaf like that, I start off with just drawing out a little leaf pattern, and you'll want the line down the center so that um, you can kind of use it as a guiding tool because you're going to be going across um, to get, I think it's called like a fishbone stitch for this, um, kind of that look of it going back and forth. So start you're gonna just start at the top where the leaf meets stick it in there and pull it all the way through and then I usually go down the center line about uh, around halfway like a third down or somewhat around there and then pull it the other way And then you're going to come back um, to the top, right beside, um, starting on one of the sides, right beside the left side, just as you can, because um, then you won't see any space or the line or anything like that. And then just pull it through again. And then you're going to cut it and go back to the kind of the point that you'd put it in. Um, but put it to the opposite side of where you're taking the stitch from. So if you're starting on the left hand side, then you're going to go to the right of the And then from there. And you'll see that it kind of starts forming that pattern of going up and down. And then just keep doing that um, alternating sides all the way down and as the space is covered 
throughout the center of the leaf, you'll just keep moving down the leaf as well. Is uh, just a question, could you use regular sewing needles or do you need an embroidery needle? I've done the like it kind of with regular sewing needles and sewing thread. Um, you wouldn't be able to thread, I don't think, at least I wouldn't, I'm not really great at threading things though. So I've never been able to thread embroidery thread through sewing needles. Mm -hmm. I have done kind of embroidery patterns with sewing needles and thread before and I find that it works out fine. So I think so, but also if you're picky or if you're really wanting to like have the same look, it would look a little different just because of how thin the fabric is. And it would probably be a little, take a little bit longer to fully cover a space. Yeah, I have the right thread, but I don't have the right needle. And I thought about it as we were kind of starting. I was like, I do not think that is going to fit through this tiny hole. <laughs> I mean, you're more than welcome to try. I, I haven't been able to get it through, but I'm also not the best at threading, so. <laughs> I feel like I have all these old tips percolating in my brain. This won't help when you're using too, too thick um, a thread for your needle to thread it. But one thing I learned a long time ago is that if you wet the eye of the needle as opposed to the thread, there's something about, I don't know if it's gravitational pull or whatever, but the, the thread will go in more readily. Oh, interesting. That's, a, that's an old embroidery tip. Interesting. I always do the, uh, the opposite. Yeah. I think that's what most of us do. But if, if I'm having a lot of trouble, I'll just go, oh yeah, right. And it goes right through. <laughs> That's really cool. Another thing that is remarkable how much it makes a difference, like even with I sew with the machine a lot and just cut the thread on an angle. Mm -hmm. So it's like diagonal and it, it'll thread so much easier rather than cutting it like perpendicular. And my mom taught me that like a couple of months ago and I was like, how have I never known this? <laughs> and you wouldn't think that it would make such a difference when it's such a fine thread but it does so certainly if you're trying to get embroidery thread I'm in the same situation as you Alexa that I have embroidery thread I can't remember what I used for but I don't have the needle to go with it and I looked at my regular needles and I was like there's no way yeah no it's not happening <laughs> um, and so so yeah but like you could bust with it and actually cut it at an angle and maybe it may fit through. I don't know. But that's also a it's really helpful. I cut all my thread like that down. It makes threading needles much easier. Yeah, I um I actually would I'm really keen to get into embroidery and I have a little hoop um and I'm gonna figure out I have a bunch of scrap material. Um but I, I just realized I don't have the right needle but um, as a kid growing up, we used to make a, at summer camps like friendship bracelets. And I have um, a bunch of different threads. I, I really want to show everyone this collection that my mom gave me because my mom sews. Um, but it's like this epic collection of all sorts of threads that I now I really need to get a needle to uh, get moving on them because I had them for crafts, but um, I'll have to go and pick up a, a needle because the leaf looks quite easy. It really is. And honestly, I, I don't know about y'all, but I stain literally everything that I wear. Um, so I found that it's been really good to cover up little stain marks on clothing and things like that. Cause I don't know, leaves are just like easy little things. And they just add to a piece of clothing, I believe. And they don't really, it's not like they're flashy or anything. They kind of mix in with patterns. That's a great idea. I definitely have some shirts and sweaters that have some stains on them that could use some, some upgrades. I don't know if this helps or not, but when I was doing embroidery a long time ago, <laughs> uh, a lot of the patterns told you to split the embroidery thread in half anyway, so that might help with the size of your needle. That's a but good you, tip. You take, I don't know how many threads are in there, maybe four? 
and it, you can split it in two or something like that. Yeah. Well, Alexa, I think you had said something about, you know, using, or maybe it's, maybe it was somebody else, about using the same color of thread when you're covering, covering, um, you know, a stain or, or whatever. I try to go at it the other way around and mm -hmm. use something bright. And I, I had this beautiful dark burgundy blouse that somehow I got some ink or something, a few ink spots on the bottom, and I just made three colorful flowers over it. Mm. And, you know, if anybody notices, you know, I don't know if they ever do, but I just think, well, gee, I think this is really cool. <laughs> so I think it's fun to, to sort of flaunt your repair as opposed to hide it. Yeah, visible mending. Yeah. Uh, that's awesome. I had a friend, um, she got this really, she has this really old cardigan that's really nice and the elbows wore out. And so she went to a visible mending workshop and she re, basically rewove like a, a patch into it with colorful yarn. Mm -hmm. So the elbows have these irregular patterns that are beautifully colored. Um, and that's actually what inspired me to learn how to visibly mend um, holes in textiles that, you know, require you to actually weave rather than something that's, you know, synthetic, um, mm -hmm. like what I'm working on now, where, you know, it's just a quick, quick hem. I'll but, show you some visible mending that I'm doing on a pair of shorts. Um, like you, I had this old pair of co cotton shorts that were falling apart and was only when after a carpenter that had been here and <laughs> I took my shorts and I thought, Jesus, I've got this huge rip in the ass. <laughs> you know, so I thought, oh, time to either chuck these or repair them. So I, I'm doing a major overhaul. I don't know if you can see this. Um, I repaired the hole in the ass <laughs> and um, then I did sash coat stitching all around it. Oh, wow. So, you know, it's it's not visible in the way of color. It's all, you know, in line with it. But anybody that looked at it could see, oh man, that's really heavily repaired. And so I got onto a roll and I realized that the um, the edges, like these shorts are probably 20 years old or so. Um, the um, cuffs were frayed. And so I had another old pair of pants that were a similar color. So I took, took the cuffs off them and put them on, um, again, on the other, the other leg. And then because I destroyed a pair of pants that, you know, that I was harvesting from, and it had a pretty cool pocket, I decided I would add, and this is what I'm working on now, I added, I don't know if you can see it very well, I took one pocket off and put it below the side pockets, so it'll be sort of like a cargo pocket. Um, yeah. Anyhow, and then I realized I have some, I have some ink stains here and there that I will probably cover up with stitching as well, but it's, you know, clearly it's a labor of love, and they aren't going to be anything that anybody's going to go whoa but well they might go whoa but they'll just go whoa you must have really loved those shorts to do all that work on them but <laughs> yeah they're comfortable and i like wearing them so why not exactly i feel like in in our current society it's like if something is broken we'll just get something new you know why bother fixing it and if you really love a piece sometimes it can be really hard to get rid of, especially if they're good quality. And um, especially some of the older pieces that have lasted this long that haven't just completely fallen apart. There's something to be said about fixing those pieces because they are going to last longer when, you know, there's so much fabric and material and clothing out there that is, is just made with, you know, the not, not great quality, um, you know, materials. It's very interesting seeing your pants there because I went through my great grandparents' cottage linens uh, this summer in Quebec, and many of the sheep looked just like that. Um, and I kept most of those ones, but there were some things that were just sun damaged. I had to cut around, take out the frayed things. Um, but it's just so interesting to see that you know this is just this is just something our four four probably mostly mothers did, and 
fathers in other things that we just need to re adapt and readopt right it's it's not new information it's just that we like you said we got used to throw away things we got used to just getting something new and what i find more disconcerting is the people that make fun of me instead of just getting rid of it why don't you just get another one that's just so silly <laughs> yeah i totally agree i was actually thinking uh about that just before about you know mending fixing repairing making your own clothing that you know, that used to be so normalized and we really did get pulled away towards this culture of um, fast fashion and, you know, the throwaway, throwaway culture. And it goes the same for clothing. Textile waste is second to largest after single use plastics. And when you look at it by volume, um, I wouldn't be surprised if it just keeps increasing, increasing um, as we become very aware of our impact when it comes to the waste we produce in the kitchen and when you're out and about with single-use plastics but textile waste is just a whole other a whole other ball game um and you know especially when you consider the intersectionalities of textile waste and how it impacts developing nations and mm -hmm. you know in terms of shipping how is the material created are the people who have created the clothing being you know treated in you know with equity or equality even so it's just it is a it's a very tricky issue but um totally agree that these are things that we need to get back to and um, i think especially in with the younger generation and, and passing on those skills i mean my mom taught me how to sew but you know it, it's a it's very much a, a generational thing and you have to be motivated otherwise if you didn't have that passed down to you Speaking of the intersectionality of it, they, there's the other piece around our clothing that we feel so happy just to give to someone else. You know, it's, it's like recycling or um, thinking that you're doing things right by recycling. Um, when you hand it off to someone else now, people feel better if they can throw it in one of these clothing bins, but it's been shown that they, they just end up in countries and they're not good clothes, so they get burnt there. And also the, the, um, the fallout, the consequence, and my experience firsthand, um, spending some time in Kenya when I volunteered there a few years ago as a teacher, is that seamstresses and tailors are becoming harder and harder to find because nobody was buying their clothes anymore because it was cheap to buy North American clothes on the black market or in any kind of little market. So you lose, you lose their, they, they also lose their skill. skill their skills aren't as, um, uh appreciated just like cobblers now right it's harder to find a cobbler so i have the first side of the hem done um so this is what the inside looks like it's a nice mostly flat edge you can't see the stitching too too much um and it wasn't really cut straight to begin with so i'm actually just going to keep going with the same thread and when i fold it back now I'll already see the line where the other hem was. And so this one is going to have a, a, a thicker edge because it's not straight, but I'm going to get it to match the back. And so I'm just going to pin it and keep going. Um. This has been really great, but I have to go now because my husband is coming back with our daughter and like Colleen, oh, yeah. there's going to be, well, there, there'll be toddler chaos that arrives. So, <laughs> um, thank you so much. This has been inspiring. And the embroidering the, the leaves, I'm going to totally do that because I think that's such a cool idea. So thank you so much. Awesome. Thanks for joining, Susie. It's great to meet you. Take care. Bye. Bye. Katie, would you mind, Jennifer, would you mind just showing me a close-up again of the, the beginning? You did the line down the center first? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you'll, here, I'll just start a new one quickly to show you.
Yeah, so you'll just draw a little leaf. And you're just using washable marker, I guess. I'm just using a Sharpie. Um, yeah, okay. It should, be, it should like be covered up by the yeah. embroidery anyway. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, so you'll draw the line all the way down the center, just as yeah. like a guide. And then start at the point of the leaf. Um, coming in at, sorry, at the top. Okay. And then I usually just go like a third of the way down. It's like just, I think, to make sure that the, it's not visible, the beginning of it gets okay. all covered up. And then you choose your, to the right or the left, um, following the outer outline. And just go right beside that starting point. And then crisscross and go down to the point um, where you would put down the middle line and just go to the opposite side of that where you're coming in. Oh, okay. And then... So you're working, the you work your way down one side no, nope, you'll you'll crisscross, oh. then you'll go to the other side of the Oh, oh okay, top, okay. And then go beside the line on the side of that. Yeah. And then once it starts to fill out a little bit, I just move down the middle line. And it doesn't really matter um, how like far down it is or anything, but just as long as you, if you're coming in with your stitch from this side, you'll always want to be on that side of the middle line. And okay. I don't find that it really, the placing of like how far down you're going doesn't matter as much as just making sure that you're always on the opposite side of the center. Okay, thank you. No problem. Jennifer, I, I want to circle back to what you were saying before about uh, dropping clothing off at donation bins and stuff. And uh, I'm thinking of, so I live, uh, I live in, in the city in, in Halifax, um, just in the north end, and we're right by a superstore, Canadian Tire, there's a strip mall, and there are some donation bins, and there are quite a few students who live in the area. And especially around COVID, but I'm sure this is an all the time problem just bags and bags of stuff yeah. thrown in or by the bins. And um, it's kind of like, you know, people, it's a sense of like, oh, well, I didn't throw it out. So at least they're yeah. getting reused. And it's still that same culture of like a throw, throwing it away. It's not, it didn't go into the garbage, but it was treated in the same way. And, yeah. you know, for one thing, I am really grateful in the community that we live in here where, if I put something out on my curb that says free within like an, two hours, someone will come and pick it up. Yeah. Um, I have the same experience. I just have a free table at the end of my driveway. Yeah. Because and, it's faster than trying to sell it. And it's just, you just, who has time to stand and self like sort of bargain with people for your junk that you don't want. <laughs> so I mean, I mean, unless you're a real, like a person who's selling vintage things as your business, it's, it's just not worth it. It's better to just give it to a home. I mean, that's where social media is really helpful for identifying things that are like, I, I held a plant exchange this spring for people to drop yeah. off plants and take plants. And it, everybody loved it. Like to take currency out of it, it helps so many people. It just makes it less complicated. I love that idea of just a plant exchange. Um, I, I was thinking too about the throwaway thing. I realized just even, well, even at my work, I see this because people know me as the person who will take care of things if nobody wants something. And I <laughs> don't necessarily have extra time to do it, but I can't stand that it's going to be thrown away. And I feel like the bigger problem isn't that people feel good about giving it away is that they can't wait to give it away. It's an immediacy issue. Mm -hmm. it's like if, if it's too inconvenient, they'll just throw it in the garbage. I see so much, so many times at my school at the end of the year, people throwing things out. And I think that's totally fine for next year. Those crayons, those pencil crayons, 
I mean, we grew up using the same pencil crayons every fall. We didn't get a new set every fall. Yeah. Um, and, and this, like the whole commercial, like back to school, you got to get your new backpack. I'm like, how many, how many new backpacks do you need? I mean, you don't wear backpacks out that quickly. Yeah. If you're yeah. taking care of them, you know. We did a I'm going to have to sign off, but I just want to show um, the finished leaf. Um, so yeah, you just put it all the way down. It closes up by its and then you can, if you want um, a stem or anything, you can just do a little, I usually go draw the line down the center a little bit, and then go down a little bit past um, where it meets, put a stitch in through there, and then just send it back down um, at the bottom of the leaf so you don't see any space, and then you'll be able to make a little stem. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for showing us how to do that, Katie. No problem. It was great meeting all of you. Bye. 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 Yeah, I'm just, I'm about halfway through the second side of my hem. This is definitely not going to be perfect, but it will look nice and finished and it'll probably allow this to go through the wash a few more times without fraying or starting to really deteriorate. Alexa, I have a silly beginner question. Yeah, so I just finished my first, my first hem. And then, so what you do is you, sl you flip it and you do the other side? Yeah, so I did, well, this had, a, it was a shirt, so it had a front and back side. Um, but if it was a pant leg, right, you do one side and then the, the other. But if you okay. just are doing it on a scrap piece of fabric, yeah, so then just, yeah, then you're you nailed it. Okay, and then do you have to do? Thank you. Do you have to do anything at the end here? Like, do you have to close up? Well, like, if it was a curtain or something or other that was one sided, you totally could. Um, but where I'm hemming um, a shirt, the ends I'm kind of sewing into themselves. Uh, this, okay, this is just folded up. But if it was a curtain, that's the only thing I can think of that would be like a flat fabric. Um, yeah, you could if you wanted to. I mean, it's it's up to you. Okay, thanks. How did your hem turn out? All right. <laughs> Luckily, I have like a I have a bit of a pattern on this, so I've just been following the pattern. But, yeah, I've just been going in and out of every like little black uh, dot here, so that's kind of helped help me stay a little consistent. Yeah. And hems are, learn, learning how to hem is, is really a good skill, especially if you are a thrifter. Um, I'm very short and anytime I purchase something, it's very rare that I find something that fits me perfect, especially pants. Um, and so it's, it's usually pretty easy to cut the pants and re-hem them, but I mean, there has to be follow through. So um, yeah. it's not only a good skill to fix clothing that you have and you love, but also um, getting the perfect piece when you go thrifting. Alexa, I don't know if this is something that um, now Katie could do for us, but it was so hard to see the picture of what she was doing. Like if she could do snapshots for us at some point in the future, just to send onto the Instagram um, page, just cause I couldn't really tell how she was going in and out. It was really hard to see. Yeah, I'll ask her for sure. Just as, you know, I don't want it to be complicated either, but it just, um, sometimes it's hard when it's left and right on a screen and you can't quite tell where you're going in or out. Mm -hmm. Anyway, this won't be a beautiful leaf, the first one, but. <laughs> yeah, it might take some practice. That's why I have my, uh, like, a, just a practice, like, scrap piece of fabric to. Oh, aren't you smart? <laughs> figure, out how, figure out how the heck to do it before botching botching it. Um, trial and error is the way to be. It's how I do most things in life. My approach is I will now be able to wear the mittens. <laughs> They're functional, great. <laughs> this is interesting to be doing this um, by Zoom. You know, like, uh, I think like everybody else during COVID, you know, had a number of different zoom experiences but i have um, a couple friends that we we get together quarterly at least with something we called stitch and soothe 
and um, we, you know, talk and stitch and largely, largely repair. Sometimes people are working on a larger art project or whatever. But we only got together one time this summer when we could do it outside and and um, so it's making me think that yeah maybe we should uh, go to a zoom process for it because actually you get to look more closely at what someone is doing than if you're six feet apart. So yeah, that's true. The mention of backpacks reminded me. Um, one thing that I do, I, I realized a long time ago that I'm not good at darning socks. Anytime I've tried to repair a sock, I just feel the repair and it just ends up annoying me more than the hold it. Mm -hmm. So I just cut up old socks and I used an old sock to reinforce the bottom of a backpack that had worn thin and I just sewed around the edges oh, of it. And yeah, there's a, and sometimes if they have a neat pattern, I'll cut part of the pattern out and sew that on as a patch but I've sort of given myself permission to not try to save the socks because I'm just not good at it but I can use them all sorts of places where you don't see them and pockets I've turned a lot of um socks just into deep deep pockets inside of pants That's um, mine, mine have held up tomato plants and um uh they're great dusters <laughs> interesting I love these tips <laughs> I've seen people use socks as scrunchies Oh yeah. Okay, so my hem is done. I'm just finishing off the knot. So, okay, um, Phyllis, you mentioned wrapping it around a few times. So would you do it the same way? That's just for a button. Oh, just for a button. Yeah. I wonder if the knot would work this way. No. I'm not as confident about my hem on this as I was uh, doing my quick hole repair. So the moment of truth is, um, we'll see how it goes. Okay. I usually do everything inside out because um, it's a bit more forgiving. Hey, that turned out pretty okay. Nice. There we go. Let's see. It's hemmed. It's not the most straight. Um, yeah, it's definitely not super straight. The back is more straight than the front, but it wasn't cut straight. So, anyways. <laughs> nice. All right. Well, without further ado, I'm going to wrap this up. Um, thank you so much for chiming in and mending and chatting and sharing tips and stories this was a, a really lovely way to send a sunday morning mm -hmm. thank you very much for setting it up my yeah. pleasure we'll share um in a in a few days i'll put the recording online and we'll post it in the facebook event so if you wanted to review and i'll ask katie if she can send some uh you know step-by-step -step instructions yeah, and you know what, maybe I could just Google it too, <laughs> if that's easier. She can just say that, Google it. <laughs> I'll, I'll look around today, see if I can find a leaf pattern like that. She's probably learned on, I mean, we're all self-taught. She's probably learned yeah. on and found a good link, but um, I'll ask yeah. her to post a link in the Facebook group. If it, if it also benefits the post, you know, it make, uh, makes for good, for good Instagrammable stuff too. It might be worth it too. <laughs> yeah. Alrighty. Well, have a great day, everyone. Thanks so much for joining. Thanks, Alexa. Thanks so Bye. much.